Helen. Thank you very much, Pierre-Antoine, and all of you for inviting me here, giving me the opportunity to speak to you. And again, I must apologize that I cannot speak in French. And hopefully, <clears throat> it'll be uh, not too difficult to follow. I also, uh, by way of um, excuses, I wasn't sure what the interests and the expertise of you were, whether you were engineers or legal scholars or sociologists, and I'm going to assume that perhaps they're a bit of every, all of those, and so what I've, I've chosen to do today is to do a lot, like cover a lot of ground, and can you not hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, and maybe there'll be a little bit of something for everybody, but they may, it may be too fast, and, and forgive me for that, but I was really enthusiastic, and I wanted to cover as much as possible. So, first of all, I want to ask this question to explain a little bit how I got into the area of privacy and why I think privacy is so interesting and important. Why privacy? Why now? And I come really at, to the problem of privacy as someone who's interested in technology, and in particular computer technology, information technology. I'm always fascinated to see this technology and what the implications are for society and how society shapes the technology. And indeed, for those of us who've been um, working in this area, it's been a remarkable journey because um, we have just, you know, r r r ridden a wave um, that has taken us to um, really unexpected and interesting places. And so what I've, s what I've shown you here, can you see that? Um, is it possible, like, just to switch these lights off? Okay, not possible. Sorry, not possible. Okay. It's just to look at all the different, and somewhere in here you're going to see all the technology, some of them you've used, some of them you haven't used. <clears throat> but this, these are the, this is the reason that privacy has been, become and emerged as a huge phenomenon in our day, thinking about privacy mainly from the perspective of someone who's interested in the philosophy of technology, how philosophy and humanity and social values work together. So why, why is it a privacy problem? Oh, I can do this automatically. Is that thing? Okay, I don't have to do that. And oh, this, this is just to remind myself that the, that the systems that challenge privacy are not necessarily GPS or web cookies, but it's GPS embedded in a much larger socio-technical system. And so the, the, the problems of privacy are not just the hardware of or the software of the technology, but it's rather technology as it's embedded in these socio-economic, you could say, institutional technical systems. Now some people, uh, and now I'm getting a little bit into the theory, you might say why are these privacy problems? Why do these systems raise privacy problems? And, and a lot then depends on what your theory of privacy is. What is privacy? And a lot of people stop there and they say oh it's just too difficult to define, we don't know what it is. And some people have a definition of privacy as your right to privacy is the right to control information about yourself. And the reason these technologies challenge privacy is because they diminish the control that people have over information about themselves. And so what we need to do to, to, to um, remediate or to solve the privacy problem is to return control to the individual. And I think that a lot of what the EU is trying to do, not completely, is to return control into the hands of the individual over information about themselves with certain qualifications and certain mechanisms. Now another approach to privacy says the reason these technologies challenge privacy is because they generate increased exposure 
GPS systems now can locate exactly where individuals are. And so th there's a way in which you're exposed that you weren't before. All the surveillance technologies and so forth. And so the solution is to diminish, it's to increase secrecy, it's to offer people ways to, to be um, hidden from such exposure. Now, of course, um, not, not in every instance. And so some, some theories say, well, well, we need to qualify both of those and say that uh, there's a private and public domain and in the, and in the private domain, you have these rights, but in the public domain, everything goes, anything goes. If you're walking in the street, someone sees you, how can you stop them from seeing you? How can you stop them from talking about you? And so this becomes um, a way of qualifying these other rights. And as a, as, a, as a way to protect privacy, you, what you want to do is protect privacy of the private and then anything goes elsewhere. Now, I, I think these are, are comp not that they're completely wrong, but that they're only very partial. And when you subscribe to those theories of privacy, then you have a very difficult problem to understand how to protect privacy and why privacy is important. And so the premise of contextual integrity, so if you just get this part of contextual integrity, I will be happy but there's more sort of technical work to do. The theory of contextual integrity as a theory of privacy, but not as a theory of the concept of privacy, but rather an account of why people are stressed. Why are we worrying about all those technologies that are applications of all those technologies that I listed at the beginning? So my argument is that what we value is not to control information, n not that we want secrecy, because the exchange of information in society is a very important part of being a social being. We want to exchange information. We have to exchange information. That's part of what society is built on. So what people want and what upsets them about these technologies is the inappropriate sharing of information, the inappropriate flow of information. And so what we need to do to protect privacy, so this theory goes, is to set or recognize appropriate constraints on the flow of information. Now, anybody who's sitting here and listening to me and you've never heard of contextual integrity, you say, ah, oh, yeah, that's, that's Great, that's great. You've just changed, taken the problem of privacy, shifted it onto this word appropriate. So what is appropriate? And that's really, that's the heart of the theory of contextual integrity. It's to answer the question of what is appropriate flow. And that's in the book and then it's developed in more, I think, um, uh, approachable ways in some papers that have followed the book. Now in order to uh, answer that question, I need us to just take a step back for a moment and to explain uh, some of the key fundamental assumptions behind the theory of contextual integrity. First, I, I want to embrace the idea that not I, I did not invent it, but that many social theorists, and I, I cite a French, Pierre Bourdieu, one of my colleagues is an expert, and I learned a lot from him, but there are other uh, social theorists who offer some version of this idea. The idea that we don't live our lives in this undifferentiated social space, but rather we engage with one another in various social contexts. And you can call it what you will, realms, domains, fields, etc. And I just call it context because I don't want to uh, commit to one particular account of social realms. And if you look at policy making, often we, we, we create these kinds of um, domains where, where we, we recognize that there's something uniform there. And these are defined by roles, like in the household, there's the, often there's the parents, there's children, there's uncles, aunts, grandparents, and so forth. And they all, you know, a whole array of healthcare, it's, it's very, there's nothing mysterious, it's very practical and um, obvious. 
And these contexts, besides the, the roles and um, practices, are governed by norms. And the norms are expectations that we have. Sometimes they're um, explicated in rules. You know, if you belong to a professional society, there may be rules that tell you as a lawyer how you should and should not act. Maybe they're just um, shared understandings. You go to a party, it's friends. Uh, if you break a glass, what are you supposed to do? Should you pay the host or shouldn't you? You know, all these kinds of rules or norms, expectations of how you should behave, customs, etc. And some of these are embedded in our legal frameworks, but there are a million that are not embedded, but they're just merely expectations. And then finally, these contexts are, are oriented around purposes and values and functions. So if you came to a university and you saw everything that everybody was doing, if you didn't know what the purpose of the university is, what the values of the university, of the educational system are, then you would not understand what a university is. And so these are really fundamental to the nature of context. Now, what I posit, what I say about um, you know, how this links to privacy is that some of the norms are what I call informational norms. And these norms model or reflect appropriate flow. And here are just some examples. These are just loose examples. Now, I'm not saying that anybody sits around and actually explicates these norms, but I'll just give, you know, a priest never shares congregants' confessions with others, you know? reasonable. Um, now here's something a little bit more complicated. I don't know what it's like in France, but you shouldn't fr share a friend's secrets with others except perhaps your spouse. You know, there's this like little exception um, unless your friend expressly requests otherwise. So it can be quite complex, these norms, but this is informally what they look like. And what I've done in contextual integrity in the theory is to try and understand uh, and analyze the, the structure of these norms. And what I've argued is that these norms, they're, they're three parameters that are fundamental to explicating the full norm. First of all, they're the actors, the senders, the recipients, and the subjects. And often, the, the senders and the subject are one and the same. Um, and in, when we talk about the actor, we're talking about the actor performing a certain function. So a single human being can perform different functions in different roles. So I can be a friend, I can be a teacher, I can be a congregant, I can be a policeman. So there could be... Um, and, and, and the, the norms govern the flow of information between these actors acting in certain capacities, um, then we need to understand the information types. Now, in other work, the attempt has been made to divide the world of information into two types. There's public information and private information. And this is another thing that the policy world has gone crazy about, and then you bump into something like a cookie or an IP address and you say, is this private or is it public? And you realize, I mean, what, what I argue is it doesn't matter if it's public or private. Let's just think about what the rules should be that govern the flow of IP addresses. We don't first need to ask the question of whether it's public or private. And then the third parameter for this norm, rule, is the transmission principle. And this is something that not many theories have identified as such. And here we can see the important role that control and consent play. Because control over information, the capacity that each individual has to control information or consent or, or, or deny consent for the flow of certain types of information to certain parties, is very important. Maybe it's one, perhaps it's the most important transmission principle, but there are many other transmission principles and it's really important to recognize 
these different transmission principles. In some instances, we may be interested in whether information could be bought or sold. Now, when you visit your physician, for example, you might argue that this physician has an obligation of confidentiality, which is to say that when you disclose some or they discover some health issue with you, they have an obligation not to disclose with anyone. How many, well, okay, I'm not going to embarrass you. I was going to say, how many people agree with that? Now, you know what? I don't agree with that because I want my physician to take that information and share it with a specialist of that disease or whatever it is. So my understanding is not that it's pure confidentiality, but it's something like a fiduciary responsibility or a stewardship responsibility to utilize that information in ways that serve my interests. So that's, that's again, I mean, I'm just giving you this as, a, as an example of a transmission principle. So now let's come back to the structure of the norm. The appropriate flow of information is flow that models e expectations, these entrenched informational norms, which have this structure. And the next part of my talk is to just get to this idea of ideal norms promote values and purposes. So anyway, we at part one, the end of the part one, and if you can't read it, it says respecting privacy means respecting entrenched context-specific informational norms. Now, if you look at that, you scratch your head and you say, oh, this is a very conservative theory. And I remember uh, in the early days when I was developing it, and, and this is immediately what people said. It means that whatever the entrenched norms are, that's what we have to do. But all these technologies that we have are, are disrupting these norms left and right. And what I'm saying here, it seems, is that we just have to do, it just, we just have to stick with what we already have. We can't allow any change. And um, I mean, I, I think that we've hugely, enormously benefited from many of the capacities that digital media and information technology have offered us. And so I don't want a theory, I can't support a theory that says we just have to do what we used to do in the past. And so now we need a theory that discriminates between disruptive flows, disruption of entrenched flows that we say are okay, and flows that we think are problematic. Now, I want to just have a little aside because I know in Europe there's great excitement about the right to be forgotten. And I'm deeply skeptical about this because I don't think we have a right to be forgotten. I think there are things that we've done and there's information about us that deserves to be remembered. And so what's important is a theory that tells you when you have a right to be forgotten and by whom and under what conditions and when not. And that's what this part of contextual integrity is trying to say. It's trying to give you an approach to saying when the one thing and when the other thing. And so what, what um, contextual integrity offers is that we need to bring to bear certain considerations. So let's say we have a new technology that, um, where your doctor can monitor your heart rate. Let, you've had a heart attack. Your physician can monitor your heart rate from his or her office. And then if, if they see some kind of irregularity, they can contact your nurse and they can contact you and say, listen, I think we need to adjust your medication. Now that's an enormous disruption of information flow. But I think many of us would say that that's a positive disruption. That's a disruption where we say, it, it, you know, perhaps we want to support this, but perhaps um, Google Maps Street View uh, driving along your street and showing photographs of identifiable individuals in the street, we might say that's a disruption that's unacceptable. No matter what the arguments are, we say that's a disruption we want to resist. So now, and now I'm going to run through this. This is, this is actually the... the the trickier part of the theory, 
which is how do we, how do we make these assessments? And the way, the, what we need to think about is set side by side the entrenched existing informational norms, side by side with the disruptions, and ask about what interests are served, and often a disruption allows some parties to benefit and other parties not to benefit or be harmed. And here we can talk about sovereignty of the individual, some or um, the, the, the shift in boundary control. Um, there's a lot of excellent, so there's a lot of excellent work that's been done already in this area and I'm able to take advantage of this work. And then some, some issues we, which we think of as general moral, social and political rights and values like uh, many people have argued about liberty and rights to liberty and autonomy, um, the fact that certain kinds of disruptions allow for um, uh, what we consider to be unfair discrimination. <coughs> and these are all part of what goes into the argument. But this part is a unique part of contextual integrity because what it says is that previously many privacy accounts of privacy are focusing on the individual and saying privacy is important for <coughs> an individual. We don't want your medical records to be spread, let's say, to someone who's considering you for employment because if they find something they don't like in that record, then they might decide not to hire you and that's harmful to the individual. Or maybe you're being hired by someone who, who, who dislikes Muslims and they, they want to ask your religion and you tell them and you know that once they hear this, they're not going to hire you. So there, there's, there's, there are many ways or if there's a, you know, I don't know, a thief who wants to find out if your house is empty. There was this app, what, does anybody know what it is? Where, um, oh, an infamous, infamous app that could tell whether you were on vacation and, and then that would be an ideal time to rob your home. So th there's a lot of ways in which the flow of information could be harmful to individuals and, and we have all this previous analysis. But what contextual integrity brings to the table, and this is a part that um, I, I've tried so hard to make it stick and uh, as much as people agree with me, um, it hasn't yet sunk in and I hope you'll go along with me, is that and this is the part of integrity, that's where the term integrity comes from, which is that appropriate flow of information serves social integrity. So the purpose of ensuring that people's health data remains well protected according to whatever the norm happens to be, and I think, uh, by the way, different societies are going to have, definitely going to have different social norms because different societies, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing maybe a little bit about Japan, but different societies have different social roles, they have different norms, and as a result of that, they're going to have different um, informational norms. But we, 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 the reason we protect healthcare information or health information, and here's just one case of it, is that if people suffer from infectious diseases, maybe a disease that's stigmatized like HIV, then if they can't be confident that this information is going to be held in confidence, they may choose not to be tested. They may choose not to reveal all information to their physicians, to hold some information back. And as a result of that, it puts the whole of society at risk. It puts their partners at risk. And so the reason we protect privacy is not only to protect the, the individual who, who is the data subject, but to protect the, in, the integrity of the sphere. And what do I mean 
by saying we protect the integrity of the sphere, I mean that if the purpose of healthcare is to promote health, alleviate suffering, and all those things, and by the way, it's going to be contentious, vary from society to society, then the fact that this rule of information flow means that people will not seek treatment or they'll lie to their doctors, that's problematic because it's now limiting the efficacy of the context to achieve and to function according to the purposes and ends of that context. And we can see lots of different examples. So if you look again at, uh, if you live in a, de a democratic country, one of the foundational premises is that each individual votes according to their autonomous decision. But if you have a society in which people's, what they vote is not protected, then we know all sorts of threats and, and so forth, coercion, which is a problem for the individual because it threatens your autonomy. But at the same time, it undermines the integrity of your democratic system. And that's what we have to think about. The same thing with home and social, which is that you could put, I mean, I talk about this to people who are parents, you could monitor your kids. You know, some people already do. You know where your kid is, they're carrying their cell phone, you've got one of these, I don't know if they have them here, but you've got a service where you can just look and see where your kid's cell phone is. That's a, you know, you might think that's the way to keep your kids safe, but the problem of that is that a family is built on trust and that particular disruptive flow not only, you know, challenge the, the, the liberty of the kid or whatever it is, but it undermines the fabric of a family and so on and so forth. So this is really, um, I mean, I care a lot about education and educational freedom and now we have these new systems third-party services that are intermediating between, uh, you know, and working for schools where, at least in the U.S., I don't know what it's like here, where data about identifiable students is being given and sold to these um, services, or the MOOCs that, do you know what a MOOC is? Um, massive. MOOCs are being run without anybody asking about the data, what's happening to the data? And if you think that education is about knowledge and, and intellect and fair distribution and all those values and purposes, then we should all be asking the question about what's happening to this data so that we can sustain those values and not have our educational system. So that's really the, the maybe my main message is that privacy is not only about the data subject, but it's about social integrity. And I love to bring this because here was Andrew Mellon. I don't know if anybody knows the name, but he was a very wealthy American, you know, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, but at this period, he was Secretary of the Treasury. And before this, tax returns were public. And if you look at the reasoning of this statement, while the government does not know every source of income of a taxpayer, and must rely upon the good faith of those reporting income still, in the great majority of cases, this reliance is entirely justifiable, principally because the taxpayer knows that in making a truthful disclosure of the sources of his income, information stops with the government. It's like confiding in one's lawyer. So the argument here is, listen, government, if you want people to report honestly, you have to protect them. And we, the government, are doing it so that, you know, rich people will report truthfully and we, the government, will benefit from their taxable income. And this is the kind of 1925, the reasoning that contextual integrity would um, encourage. And so this is just a summary of contextual integrity um, that, that at the first step, respecting privacy is to respect these entrenched information flows and if there is, the if, if when we see these disruptive flows, the ways to analyze them um, is, and always within the context is in terms of interests and, and general rights, but importantly, these context specific ends, purposes and values. Now these are just some of my favorite um, things, which is 
here, privacy is not the opposite of sharing. It's the opposite of inappropriate sharing. By the way, information does not belong to you. It's about you. I mean, that doesn't follow from contextual integrity. It's just something I like to say. The contours of privacy are socially and culturally varied. That doesn't mean that privacy isn't a fundamental right. It just means that because it's built on top of social structure, it must vary. It will vary. And that letting people choose uh, may neither be in their interest nor morally required. Maybe we have a slight disagreement. I don't know. Okay. Um, all right. And, and I'm happy to say, and this is, by the way, I'm going to talk more about this aspect of the work. Uh, in in uh, last year, um, the White House released a, a report and they uh, developed this consumer Internet Privacy Bill of Rights, and they have this um, thing called respect for context. Unfortunately, context uh, is a word that has so many meanings, and many people are jockeying to be the ones to give the interpretation, and tomorrow I'm going to talk a little bit, um, I mean, I'm going to review some of what I've already said today, but then I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think my interpretation is the one that will be uh, grounds for progress. Now, I'll just spend the last 10 minutes, at least about 10 minutes, I think, on applications because although theory is lovely, um, I actually, uh, unless the theory can um, be tested by fact and material challenges, it just remains that. And, you know, I don't know if you know the saying, where the rubber hits the road. And so some of what I do in the applications is to test whether contextual integrity actually works. And it's been really a remarkable experience because in, in some of these um, projects, and let me say that all the projects I'm going to talk about are not all mine, and many of them I'm that our mine are in collaboration and the, the theory continues to be honed and I see mistakes and so forth. So I don't see this as somehow separate from the theory itself. And then um, the other effort is to show how we can use contextual integrity to diagnose a privacy problem and then also to prescribe, to prescribe policy, to prescribe um, technical design. So the applications, um, the, the, the methodologies are sometimes empirical, sometimes they're analytical, like philosophical, and sometimes we actually are building or analyzing technical design. And the method, the heuristic, is this a French word that I think is an English word? <laughs> do, you, do you have that? Heurist, heuristic? Okay, sounds better that way. Is that... First, we, when, we, when we look at some newly introduced, uh, you know, Google just announced, um, I don't know how many of you use Google products, probably everybody, every time you go to a Google product at the moment, you see this little sign that says that they've introduced a, a change in their policy. Um, Facebook, of course, is changing their policies all the time. Uh, we have a, some kind of system in place and, and we immediately... So the first thing to do is to recognize that there's been a disruptive flow and when we do it, if you follow the, the framework of contextual integrity, it guides you to say, is it in the actors who are receiving the information? Is it in different information types now being available? For example, big data. Some of us, uh, do you know the target case? The, 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 the application of these data analytics, target was able to identify pregnant women just on the basis of their purchasing pa patterns, having no access to their medical information. To, so you could say, hey, you know, that, that's a disruptive flow because suddenly an information type that wasn't accessible is now. Or the transmission principle changes. And so that's to capture disruptive flow um, and locate the nature and source of disruption. 
and then do this evaluation. Um, and, and so the projects do some of all of these. So the ones that I've highlighted here, I'm just going to say a little bit more. And each one of them is, is a project that's going on, some of them completed, going on uh, in their, in their, um, in their own, with their own momentum. So I think I'm going to talk first. So this particular work was work with computer scientists. When they heard me give a talk like this one, they came up to me afterwards and said, you know, we, we look at that informational, informational norm. Um, we're able to express that norm in this particular logic, which is formal language. And then once we do that, we can actually implement <coughs> rules that are richer in their nature. We can internalize some of the requirements within a data access system. And in particular, Anupam Data, we've worked together to look at um, HIPAA is, is in the US the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, and it has a set of privacy rules. And this is one of the actual, this is the language taken from, from these privacy rules. And, and what you can see in an interesting way is that red is actors, um, green is the transmission principle, and the blue is, is information types. That's just it's like the coding. You may remember it from a few slides before. Anyway, so we, we take that, we then can express these rules in, in this logic and we can then implement it in some kind of a hospital database, for example, to make sure. Now, one thing you can see over here is that if you read this, that I, reading this with a critical eye, I say, hang on a sec, this rule is incomplete because it doesn't specify the recipient, and by not specifying the recipient, you generate an ambiguity. You know, you can express this rule, but unless you actually say um, to whom, so if you take something like a psychiatrist, your psychiatric records, you may say, oh, that's, that's really confidential. Nobody, nobody should have your psychiatric record. And my pushback is, actually, yes, your psychiatrist. So the, it's, there's, what you need to know is that it's not that nobody can get the information, but the information needs to flow. And when you, when you, um, when you express the flow in terms of an informational norm, if you want to be rigorous about it, and, and it's very boring to be rigorous all the time, but if you want to be rigorous, then you need to fill in all those, um, all, all the, um, all the parameters. Now, in the in the area, the the placement of court records on the open web is an issue. And again, I'm curious what the situation is in France, because um, in the U.S., court records are public records. So in the past. And, and this is a paper that's done, but we're now on part two of this work. If you wanted, here's a court. This is the United States Bankruptcy Court. If in the United States you were interested in looking up whether someone went bankrupt, you could go to the, you would have to go physically to the bankruptcy court. But then the court records are open and they're public records with all the information listed. Is that the case? Yes, because I know in Spain they find this whole idea horrific. In Spain, <coughs> murder, everything is highly confidential and um, if they announce that, uh, that, that there's a court case and the details of the court case, the, once they make it public or right, even the newspapers are not necessarily a, allowed to publish, but they're definitely not allowed to identify the individuals who are involved. But th in the US, there's a completely different notion. And so now, the idea, and already this has been happening, um, so for example, this is what an old-fashioned uh, 
bankruptcy record is, and um, then you, you have these, these are already being placed online. I won't go into any of the details, but sorry about that. Um, we're trying to use court records as an example of uh, how you can apply contextual integrity. The question is, should we place these court records online? Now, the knee-jerk answer is, um, these records are public records, so public is public. If a person can just walk into a courthouse and get the record on a piece of paper, it's just going to make it a lot more efficient if you post these records online. Now, of course, those of us who've been studying information technology, we say, whoa, there's a huge difference between having something in a courthouse and being able to Google it. And I know that in Europe, there have been some really interesting court cases to that effect, um, which I won't go into. And so there's a huge difference. And so cont in contextual integrity, we try and be precise about what that difference is. Um, and our current proposal is that we do allow court records to be placed online, but we develop fine-grained differential access rules which um, take into consideration these, which you can recognize as the parameters. And this is, this is work in progress, again, working with a computer scientist. I'm not a lawyer by training. Um, we have a, a legal research fellow working on this project. Finally, um, this is the part that I really enjoy, which is to develop little systems or um, uh, um, intervene in certain kinds of arenas with systems that we think maintain contextual integrity. Cryptogram is done by a couple of PhD students at NYU, and this is work that I've been involved in um, with actually uh, Vince, Vincent Turiana, who's a French computer scientist at Canil and Daniel Howe, and uh, this is a brand new system, but anyway, um, I'm, I'm wanting to advertise, okay, so cryptogram, what cryptogram does is take a photo and do that with it. So if you post your photos on Facebook and you don't want Facebook to have access to your photos in the clear and you don't want them to be using your photos as a way to hone their facial recognition system, you can apply, it's free, it works, it's terrific. You can use cryptogram to do this and then you can give your friends access to your photos and they can see them in the clear. Um, obfuscation is a very exciting way to protect privacy by introducing a lot of noise to hide information. And so if you, do you know this character? Is this also a French? Okay. So I just showed you how you would hide, um, um, what's his name? Um, Waldo. Waldo, Waldo. Is he called Waldo? It's Wally, but in France it's Charlie. Charlie. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right. How do you, how do you see hide? We saw how we hide him in cryptogram. In obfuscation, this is how you hide. And I love this because it's not, it doesn't have to be technical. And again, I don't know whether this is just how particular this is to different cultures, but you know, you give the recipe out, but you leave out a little bit of this or you, a little bit of that. So that's a obfuscatory technique. Um, but we try to make this technically rigorous. This is a system that's available for free. Does anybody here know about Track Me Not? Okay. Huh. So it's to uh, obfuscate your web searches. It's been going till 2006. Vincent is, continues to improve it and do amazing things with it. Actually, you can now use Track Me Not to obfuscate even searches on something like Amazon.com. Any, any system that has a search mechanism and is open, um, you can apply Track Me Not to it. And if you really um, want to try and fool the NSA, you can introduce um, queries that are the keywords that are monitored by the Department of Homeland Security. And this is the final, um, this, is, this is the brand new system. What this system does is um, it's, it's concerned about online tracking where when you click ads, 
that are generated by ad networks, this is one of the most revealing pieces of information about you that influences your profile. And so what this system does, it kind of functions, but it's very much in alpha. If, you, if you're adventurous, you can go to this. And we don't really, this is the name, but we, we're not settling on that name. But what this system does, you know, what, how would you, the, um, the whole do not track effort has been a failure thus far. This system says we're never going to.